which is organized through the CAA Getty and the International Program, uh, the CAA Getty International Program and the International Committee. During last year's annual conference, there were four global conversations sessions. Our rich discussions did not end there. So immediately after that, we've had our conversations via CAA Commons, and those rich discussions um, have really just culminated into what has been this um, um, engaging process, but also the panel that you see here today. Um, so for that reason, I'd really like to thank all the CAA Getty, Getty alumni who were part of those conversations. And some of them, of course, are here. Um, some of them are watching through the live stream. But I'd like to thank them for, for having greatly contributed to shaping the session theme, which is border crossings, the migration of art, people, and ideas. I'd also like to thank my co-convener, Sandra Oskokovich, who couldn't join us today, but was really also um, played a, an important role in shaping the, 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 the session theme. So the panel um, examines some of the overlooked narratives of the permeability and impermeability of both physical and abstract social, cultural, and political borders. It, in some ways, evokes Doreen Massey's um, argument that places are processes. They do not have boundaries in the sense of divisions which frame simple enclosures. Places do not have single unique identities. They are full of internal conflicts. She also reminds us that globalization of social relations is yet another source of and reproduction of geographical uneven development and calls for a global sense of the local, a global sense of place. So today, these discussions will be looking at the paradoxes, the predicaments that we face today with the continuing reinforcement of boundaries, but also this, the, the moments when those boundaries become permeable um, and fluid. So it's, also, it's my pleasure to present the panel today, um, but I'll start with, our dis with thanking our discussant, Professor Saloni Matur, for, for agreeing to be part of this process. Um, and uh, she's the professor of, of modern and contemporary South Asian art in the Department of art, art History at UCLA. So thank you so much in advance for being here with us. Um, our first speaker will be uh, Cesar Bartholomew, who is the, who's an artist and professor of art history at the Department of Creative Arts, University, at, at the, at the um, excuse me, um, professor of art history in, at the School of Fine Arts, Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, Pedro Laiwola, who is artist and professor of art history in the Department of Creative Arts, the University of Lagos in Nigeria. Ilde Kofeha, associate professor um, in the Department of Art History at the Hungarian University of Fine Arts, Budapest, um, Hungary. And uh, Parul Panjada, who is Associate Professor of South and South Asian, uh, Southeast Asian um, Art History in the Department of History at the University of Delhi in India. And I am Nomo Samakubu, and I will be chairing the panel, the session for today. Thank you so much. Hello. Can you hear me, everybody? Hi. I would like to thank everyone involved in getting us here, and Namusa for taking care, Janet Landy, and of course the Getty Foundation, and your presence here. Um, I would like to start with two quotes. Black would, therefore, be one of the names of our difference, which is in Black Culture's Brazilian Civilization by Joel Rufino. And the second quote, in fact, according to Arendt, what makes the savages different from other human beings is the last the color of their skin, but then the fear that they behave like a part of nature, that they treat nature as their undisputed master, Nature thus remains, in all its majesty, 
an overwhelming reality compared to which they appear to be phantoms, unreal and ghost-like. Oh, thank you for that. that, that that's better, <laughs> otherwise I won't be able to read. It might seem odd to start a text that aims both to present Haru Ohara's work and to propose an interpretation of his photographs, quoting current analysis on slavery. Especially if we know that slavery was finally abolished in Brazil in 1888, and Ohara was born in the Kochi province in Japan in 1909. He migrated to Brazil in 1927 and started taking pictures in 1938. So, exact 50 years separate the two facts. The wave of Japanese migration to Brazil in the early 20th century is part of a state policy meant to replace slave workforce, a workforce that was mainly confined to plantations. After the end of slavery, farm owners would not employ black people and preferred instead to use those white, or almost white, the racially mixed majority that constitute the Brazilian population, part white, part black, part native. In the 1930s, developments of that situation became critical. First, there is the dissemination of a myth that considers Brazil a peaceful racial melting spot, an idea fostered by white intellectuals like Gilberto Freire and Sérgio Buarque de Holanda. That point of view quickly became common sense and it is still employed today, for instance, even when interpreting Ohara's body of work and its relationship to race. Quote, so many heroic sagas constitute a Brazil that is native, black, white with eyes that are slit and beautiful, smiling towards the future in a Brazil that has no walls, end quote. That quote is very interesting. While it seems to reaffirm still today the idea of the racial melting pot and its denial of racism, it actually states and orders races considered pure in a way that makes possible to poetically fuse oriental into white. Anyway, the melting pot idea accepted by the majority of the Brazilian population throughout the 20th century does not acknowledge the continuing severe economic and cultural situation that the black population still faces. After the end of slavery, black people had eventually to move to coastal cities in search for jobs. The minimum jobs available came with extremely low salaries, which increased enormously the size of the favelas first created in the end of 19th century. That is why the 1930s also saw the birth of the first organized black groups that protested racism. A racism very hard to protest since in Brazil it is always implied rather than directly expressed since it is mainly structural. Finally, in the 1930s, international migration policies were reinforced and took a racial bias. According to the Brazilian, Brazilian Ministry of Justice, which was responsible at the time for those policies, um, oh, okay. uh, by those policies, oh, I lost my, I lost the plot. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Something came up in the computer. That's why. Okay. Finally, in the 1930s, international migration policies were reinforced and took a racial bias according to the Brazilian Ministry of Justice, which was responsible at the time for those policies. Some immigrants were desirable and some were not. Immigration, according to their own words, was a way not only to bring new agricultural workers, but to whiten the Brazilian population. That's what the government said. Nonetheless, those migration policies in the 1930s included the Japanese. They were white, or at least, white enough. Perhaps Joel Rufino's definition of blackness in Brazil may provide an explanation for the dynamics that allowed Japanese in Brazil to be identified to white people's position. I quote, in our definition, black 
is a social space instituted by many instances. The dark color of the skin, popular culture, African ancestry, remote or close, poverty, attribution of blackness by others, and acknowledgement of, her, of that identity for himself. To make sure it is a place, a topos, it is enough to think of the difficulty we have in Brazil to classify individuals who do not fulfill one of those instance, instances. A rich black man, or someone that doesn't dance to samba, someone that does not identify as black, or is not seen by his friends as such, is less black. That Brazilian peculiarity, blackness as a place and not as a race, has been one of the obstacles to the understanding of our racial relationships by foreigners, especially North Americans." End quote. So the Japanese can be white. In the late 30s, Brazilian and Japanese governments facilitated not only migration to Brazil, but also buying lands. In comparison, it should be noted that after the end of slavery, no policy whatsoever was set in place by the Brazilian government to integrate black people into the Brazilian social fabric. No financial help, no inclusion in education, no social programs. In terms of culture, the lack of economic and educational inclusion had, as a consequence, the perpetuation of black culture as foreign, since the cultural system has basically white people as their subjects and targets, and immaterial. Other than cooking, music, dance, and religion, no African culture could materialize itself under slavery. That, unfortunately, implies that not only visual representation of slavery in the 19th century is rather coincidental, but representation of black lives by black people in the 20th century art is also scarce, with few exceptions. In that sense, Joel Rufino's and Achille Bembe's quotes finally may seem more on point. Black would indeed be the name of our unspoken difference, or in this case, unrepresented difference, supplement not taking into account difference understood as Derrida's difference. And through this difference, nature, as seen in O'Hara's pictures, should be understood negatively. In his pictures, nature, and the plantation more specifically, should not only be seen as art or the setting of biographic documents of migration, but also as a display of what was historically denied, of what may still be denied for, to the black population. In that sense, I completely disagree with Sergio Bougie who writes about O'Hara's work in the catalog of his major exhibition that happened in Instituto Moreira Salles in 2016. Quote, his work, aligned with modernist and humanist photography from the mid 20th century, contributes to show that some of the atavistic antagonisms of Brazilian culture, such as that one that opposes the countryside and the city as symbols of the archaic and modern, heritage from our colonial extractive and slavery period do not stand against the appearance of a new historic character in the passage from the 19th to the 20th century, the European or Asian immigrant that renews culturally and economically the, economically the country from the countryside on and who, and that is Haru Ohara's specific case, embodies both the man of nature and the man of culture. Culture, end quote. Um, can you? I hope that. <laughs> the social and cultural relationships that constitute Brazil do resist the presence of the immigrant. However, complex social relationships in, may be in Brazil, a complexity that, according to the C. Ribeiro and Sueli Honik, will not necessarily adhere to the purity that constitutes binary colonial identities. As we read in Rufino's quote, immigrants are quickly situated within the colonial modern frame, valued as people who come from sovereign countries with a sovereign culture, and therefore their presence in nature as workers do not imply that they were men of nature. 
they do not belong to nature as black people did. Their presence does not solve or change the atavistic antagonisms of Brazilian culture. If anything, immigrants move within it. Unlike the archaic ghosts expressed in Bembe's quote, who remain tied to nature, reduced to their work capability, and later on, as ghosts trapped and limited to a naturalized, unjust social structure in big cities, immigrants will seek modernity in life as in images. O'Hara, as I said, bought his farm in 1933 after six years of working in the Sao Paulo countryside. He bought a camera and started taking pictures from 1938 until 1973, when his wife died, and he decided to abandon photography altogether. During this period, he actively photographed mainly one thing, nature, producing around 20,000 films, many of which still remain unseen. Nature, limited to his farm, but connected to spirituality, society, culture, family, and work. Circa 20,000 images already made public allow us to categorize his work in two main periods, 1938 to 51 and 1951 to 73. In the period ranging from 38 to 51, we see nature photographed in black and white. His farm was one of the first ones acquired by the Japanese in Londrina, Paraná, a city located in the south of Brazil. In 1951, the farm was expropriated by the government to build Londrina's first airport. And then, his artistic endeavors gave way almost entirely to vernacular photography. Although nature remains a recurring interest after that, it stopped being a fundamental everyday experience. We do not get to see big landscapes or people working in nature anymore. His environment has clearly changed. And from 1958 on, color images abound. Color images of small trips, family gatherings, birthdays, and marriages abound, with very few exceptions, like these I'm going to show you now. It should be noted that there are no pictures from before he took possession of his own farm. The farm and the camera equate as spaces that characterize humanity. The possession of a farm allows work to separate itself from nature, pragmatically, because it provides making the future possible. The camera allows work to become creative, aesthetically, and thus shows that the future can be imagined, and that imagination can be materialized in pictures. It is important to notice that O'Hara's photographs from the first period are an important exception to the enduring lack of artistic and photographic representation of labor in Brazil, attesting not only to the previous idea of the plantation workers' relationship to nature, but also a continuing aristocratic disregard for any manual labor that persists in Brazil, and in that, perhaps like the critical issue at stake that allow us uh, to interpret and relate the slave plantation and O'Hara's farm, work, and how work is valued in Brazil. <laughs> that first period of O'Hara's work, produced from 38 to 51, is, without exception, the object of study, interpretation, and presentation by Brazilian scholars and curators. Most of these photographs benefit from an artistic status since they both reunite, they reunite both cultural issues regarding migration, poetic comments on everyday life in the farm, and proto-modern formal experiments. That is the cutest image you're gonna see today. I have to say. <clears throat> These formal experiments potentially can be connected to, to his Japanese origins. It is even more possible to establish a relationship between nature and work 
as his main themes. And Japanese art and mentality, nature, apprehended in its essence, inspires devotion and fortitude rather than opposition and control, and work ensues. Nature is seen as wondrous. However, we must also take into account that Ohara arrived in Brazil at the age of 18, and his years of photography must all also be considered as part of his active engagement in photo clubs. He was a part of the Bandeirantes Photo Club in Sao Paulo, Brazil's most important photo club, in which the 1940s concrete artists showed their abstract and geometric experiments with photography. And Ohara was also the founder of a photo club in his home city, Londrina. Interpretation of Ohara's works by critics and scholars tend to follow these categories. That is, aesthetic, document of my migration, and proto-formal experimentation. Some critics tend to focus more on aesthetic interpretation of his early images, whereas some assume the pictures are transparent documents of migration, its importance tied to the artist biography, to the social rituals, to the preservation of Japanese values, and adaptation to Brazilian culture. In both interpretations, I see limitations, as they downplay the larger cultural and critical context by repeating two familiar processes. Art is seen as aesthetic, something formal, severed from a larger symbolic meaning by being connected, essentially to expression. And the photograph is seen, in s that is a second idea, and the photograph might be seen as aesthetic, anthropological object. That is, its aesthetic project's scope and complexity muted, and its context, context decontextualized and or devalued as to state past as past and as such to placate past or present cultural tensions. In Brazil, the idea of art is historically located within the colonial system. Not only traditional values, art, artistic values, were imported from Europe in the 19th century, but the art system is formed and maintained by a cultural elite that still identifies with, tho with those 19th century values. They identify themselves as white, aspiring to be Europeans. And thus, art exists in, the, uh, in an alienated system where the most poignant social drama is sublimated, aestheticized, misrepresented, or not represented at all. In that sense, it comes as no surprise that both qualities of discourse conveyed about Haru Ohara's work are themselves aesthetic. Aesthetic understood as devoid of political stance, avoiding the ghosts of those that were reduced to their workforce or those removed and substituted by the immigrants. Of course, it is not Ohara's role or his pictures to assume that political stance. The political issue at stake here is a ghostly pre persistence seen by the he historian. Nature in Ohara's plantation is seen as limitless, giving and an sort of benevolent. It provides to everyday life meaning and sustenance. It provides the possibility of poetic aspiration for the sublime. Fruits, as you've seen, stand not for money, but for the future. Work is seen as something positive, dignified, and intrinsically humane. After all, in Japanese mentality, quote, absolute harmony is not attained through effort. Instead, the casting away of desire, will, and self itself is what is required, end quote. However, it is true that Ohara's models uh, show self, uh, although it is true that Ohara's models show selflessness in relation to na nature, something that makes them initially perfect as workforce, we see no indication that they see themselves as part of nature. They are, after all, representing themselves as part of culture in nature, both in form and in themes. A foreign culture that therefore cannot be deemed primitive and dismissed. Somehow, 
The pleasure we derive from Ohara's pictures is exactly the fact that they uh, is in exactly the fact that they display ascension, but as a farce. He's occupying the place of the slave and the plantation, and the fact that they are working can be poetic because it is, it is known that it will pass. If anything, the second phase of Haruo's work expresses, however, that his aesthetic project is tied to the farm, to his being conditioned to a pre-modern life. His drive is clearly lost as the immigrant finds his place in the city in, in the 1960s and 70s. And his relationship to nature becomes prag completely pragmatic. Pragmatically white to the extent that he finally photographs not only black people and their culture as passing curiosity, representing the ghost of the plantation as displaced in place and in culture, but he also photographs vernacular images of Japanese style southern Brazilian landscapes made out of butterfly wings, something a tourist would do or collect. The images are not good because that's the second phase of his work in which um, basically it was not anymore an artistic endeavor but uh, rather vernacular photography. By taking notice and collecting these images through photography, we understand that nature became triply foreign for him, since nature, Japanese culture, and their relationship all became up for consumption as exotic. The irony of his own displacement, in this case, the second one, should not be lost. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the Getty Foundation for inviting me to present at this amazing conference. I'd like to add also that I've been enjoying Los Angeles despite the intense cold. <laughs> um, I'm talking about conversations across borders and how this has been fostered, art linkages have been fostered in the age of information technology. Information and communication technology has impacted societies in ways that have become crucial in disseminating knowledge and information from one corner of the globe to another. The nature of diffusion ICT provides has transformed the way and manner in which people across cultures, countries, and languages interact. At the center of this transformation is the computer and social media, which are critical to the exchange and migration of ideas. This is particularly important when one thinks of the conversations occurring across borders, fostered by this new wave of technological development in the field of the visual arts and culture. Added to this is the increasing use of smartphones and other cellular devices which are readily available and have contributed to the interconnectivity of cultures. In Nigeria, Lagos is the information and communication hub. When Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg visited Nigeria in 2016 and remarked the great entrepreneurial and technological spirit he found in Lagos. A large number of telecommunication co companies abound alongside the popular computer village at Ikeja, a business outlet that connects the economies of countries in Asia to Nigeria through the trade in cellular devices in response to the insatiable quest to connect to the World Wide Web. With both data and cellular devices, instant messages, photographs, videos, and news can be easily and quickly disseminated. In the culture sector, ICT has become particularly important when we take into consideration the large number of artists, curators, and cultural institutions in Nigeria that have started to enjoy the benefits of this sort of visibility these various digital and electronic platforms offer. 
Today, an avalanche of websites, blogs, Facebook, Instagram, and other digital platforms abound in Nigeria, which create an information highway in the cultural sector. The number one Nigerian auction house, Art House, the famous Nigerian-based art fair, ArtX, which debuted in 2016, have been very successful in their use of social media in disseminating information about the activities and bringing a diverse range of visitors into Lagos. This paper focuses on the Center for Contemporary Arts, Lagos, a non-profit organization founded by an independent curator, B.C. Silver, in 2007 as an exemplar in using electronic platforms in fostering global conversations. At the core of CCA's mission is to create a critical mass of curators and artists that will engage the visual culture of Africa. In a trail of 10 years, CCA has transformed the art practice of several artists into more expressive forms such that engage with history and the archives. It has mentored a group of young uh, local and international scholars through its residency programs. It has given direction to several curators that engage in collaborative projects. This way, a conversation that is far-reaching emerges in the study, dissemination, and understanding of the contemporary visual culture of Africa. Several art institutions and galleries in Nigeria are also now keen into the sort of international currency that CCA enjoys. The questions therefore arise, what strategies and platforms has the CCA used in fostering global conversations in the arts? How effective have these platforms been in establishing art linkages across cultures? How does social media help in extending the vision of the CCA? In what ways have the whole gamut of information technology aided the transfer of ideas across borders as against physical movement of artists and curators? This paper discusses the impact of ICT in fostering global conversations in the arts using the CCA experience. This is Silver, curator and director of the Center for Contemporary Arts Lagos, has curated several local and international exhibitions. She also published a monograph on the Nigerian photographer, Ohai Ojekere, and a book on a curatorial project, Asiku, which began in the year 2010. Her, her pedigree as an international uh, curator in many ways lends credence to the Center for Contemporary Arts. Bissi Silva has acquired technical, had acquired technical knowledge in the field of project management with the British Gas Management Project in the UK, where she managed the European user interface and enriched the content of their website. She served in this capacity for three years before returning to Nigeria. Silva set up her own company, Digital for Technology, located at Commercial Road Yaba, very close to CCA, uh, focusing on web design and digital technology. She carried out several projects for a couple of corporate organizations and later uh, took this experience that she got or garnered in um, London and in Paris to the CCA when it was established. So CCA has uh, been very successful in broadening the reach of artists and curators and created avenues for interconnectedness of world cultures. I will present how a few of such linkages have been fostered using social media. First of all, in order to reach the vast number of cultural enthusiasts, art artists, scholars, curators, and arts patrons within and outside the Lagos area, Silva evolved a strategy which was simple but effective for the, from the inception of the center she recounts. And I quote, we position ourselves to make use of digital and information platforms through a semi-structured strategy. The first was a frequent email information system targeted mainly for the benefit of local artists, curators, writers, and art enthusiasts as a way of getting and keeping them interested not only about our activities, but other activities, other artistic programs across the world, end of quote. Creating a huge mailing list of interested people uh, within and outside Nigeria was important for the CCA. So vital was the information flow that once CCA developed an e-audience, it was able to move vital documents like the invitation cards and posters to the virtual realm as a key component in reaching a wider audience. There's also the establishment of the video art network. And from the onset, the CCA defined its area of interest in artistic genres such as photography, video arts, sound art, film, performance art, and other aspects of new media, which are at the very core of digital technology. And the Video Arts Network was founded in 2009 by Jude Anogui, uh, Oyinda Fakeye, and uh, Emeka Ogbo, under the auspices of the C Center for uh, Contemporary Arts. And they had a first video arts exhibition in Nigeria and moved to several other places 
around the world. In 2002, um, Silva initiated a personal blog, Art Speaks Africa, which focused on her work as a freelance curator. In a short lifespan, the blog was impactful and helped in developing a sizable followership. Uh, she also used the very effectively the platform provided by eFlux, which with over 100,000 subscribers across the world. And then we have the uh, CCA Lagos website, which was set up to fulfill the need to create a dialogue with people across Africa and the rest of the world. Uh, she also mentioned that the exhibition and talk pages were the core of the information that interested international visitors. And in fact, she calls it, and I quote, uh, our international uh, calling cards. And it was vis visited from across the world to find out about new artists and topics that were being engaged locally. Uh, another very important aspect of her work um, is the ASICO, which uh, is a um, part workshop, in quotes, part workshop, part residency, and a part, and part art academy that was established uh, by Silva. And through social media platforms, the publications that emerged from this project was distributed widely. And similarly, she also did um, um, a Kickstarter campaign for a monograph which she published on uh, Okai um, JK, and this was also um, put on Facebook. She, did, uh, she carried out crowdfunding for this publication, enabled, uh, which enabled a diverse audience engaged in the process of making and documenting the work of a Nigerian photographer whose works, although based on local artistic traditions, extend in appreciation beyond the borders of Nigeria. Other social media platforms CCA used are Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Although the Instagram and Twitter were, are fairly well used, far the most important of all of these social network, social media platforms used by CCA is Facebook. Between the Facebook accounts of Olabisi Silva and CCA, established in 2002 and 2012, respectively, uh, the activities of CCA were projected through both accounts and Facebook played a major role in fostering links and providing on-the-spot responses from the audience in its highly spontaneous and interactive nature. Um, so I just go on to talk about um, the fact that Silva herself also established contacts with old schoolmates and colleagues, co-curators from the Royal School of College of Arts in London and Paris, where she studied, and this in many ways broadened her network of connections globally. And this also, also helped in positioning the CCA on the global arts scene. The, net, the website had several posts which fall under light news. She had criticisms of Nigerian government and its institutions, obituaries in the art circles, general phone remarks, and sometimes pleasurable moments experienced by the curator. We get a sense of following Sylvia on her journeys around the world as she traverses gallery spaces, museums, and pictures, even her attendance at Lagos parties where she winds down. So the Facebook page is indeed a mixed grill of events. Uh, the CCA also hosted quite a number of artists and scholars from across the world, some making their first appearance in Nigeria and others who had been there before. But she provided the platform um, for them to present their works to a Lagos audience. All these activities are well listed and described under the talks and workshops section of the website. Uh, there are other platforms like the face to Facebook platform where she has been engaged in global discussions uh, with um, artists and scholars. And in a sense, there's so much information going on uh, in such a way that BC herself complains about the fact that she's having so many requests from all over the world. And I quote this very interesting um, thing I found on the site. Dear friends and colleagues, from Monday the 22nd July, please can you postpone new requests, questions, reference letters, visa letters, recommendation letters, and all of that uh, till the end of September by Facebook, email, and other social or electronic media avenues. Thank you for comprehension and support. As we say in Nigeria, and I quote, I appreciate you. Despite these recorded successes, Silva laments that an estimated 25% of the possibilities and capabilities that social media offers is what is utilized presently at CCA. Uh, I'm going to conclude by saying that information technology has placed, played a very vital role in establishing further cultural linkages between Nigeria and other countries through the arts activities of the Center for Contemporary Arts in Lagos. A multi-directional flow of information has been established in such a manner as to inform various publics and to bring many people or more people into the circuit of art production 
exhibitions and documentation. Through its activities, the CCA has brought in art professionals from different parts of the world to dialogue with locally based artists in such a way as to position Lagos as a formidable global art center. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my many thanks to the CAA and the Getty Foundation uh, for support my uh, travel and uh, presentation. Yeah, I try. Thank you. <laughs> so it's okay? No, not yet. And now, okay. According to politicians uh, discussing uh, the immigration of refugees to Europe, we are living in the most critical times since, the world, since World War II. My country, Hungary, is on the migration route from Syria and the Middle East to Western Europe. It will be a long and difficult process to understand the current migration waves, every aspect and social impact. There's no doubt that art and artists reacted immediately and in, and in a very sensitive way to these social challenges. In recent years, it is more often than not that we can see exhibitions or individual works of art in art galleries and public spaces in Western and Eastern Europe, a light that are a reflection on issues raised by migration in one way or other. Very good example is the camp. Uh, camp means a center for art on migration politics is a non-profit exhibition venue for art discussing questions for this displacement, migration, immigration. The center is located in the uh, Trampoline House, an independent community center in Copenhagen and Denmark. In the meantime, the topic of art and migration has generated considerable literature as well. Only some of the most relevant Julia, Kristeva, Judith Butler, Susan Sontag's works. We must highlight the importance of DG Demos studies. <coughs> Demos works uh, focuses on the inter intersection of contemporary art and politics, particularly in the areas of photography and moving image art. I'm convinced that we, art historians and uh, professors, have the responsibility to study, document, and evaluate these products in every possible aspect. Our most important task is to prepare a precise documentation of these phenomena and to start to research its artistic angles. It is obvious that politics and migration are very closely linked, but more, they are inseparable since Migration is tied to not notions such as xenophobia, racism, and exclusion, and uncertain future. Still, the way artists, historians, scientists deal with it and elaborate the, th the theme can help avoid fears of the unknown and the unfamiliar. I would like to stress the role of the film and photo genres. Uh, Uh, I would like to state the role of the film and the photo genre since they primarily attempt to document and focus our attention on human lives, the fate of the people arriving to Europe through the Balkans. But the social role of these works of art and exhibition is much more, most of the time, than simple documentation. They obviously help understand the migrants' lives and bring their personal tragedies closer to everyday people. We can understand the significance of that if we consider that several conservative political parties or governments, including that of Hungary, are really 
uh, are uh, relaying people against inclusion in their political propaganda, inciting fear and hatred. The art forms of photo and film have an important role to play in such situations. In certain cases, it's also worthwhile to study the venue of the exhibitions that put migra migration in the center. They are often held not in traditional exhibition space, but further away from those at railway stations, transport hubs, and other public spaces so that they could find their way to a wider audience. That is because migration affects everyone, and it is an issue not restricted to a small audience. In Europe, the issue of mig migration is one of the most burning social issues, part of daily, of daily politics. The heads of European governments have reacted in different ways to the issue of migration. We can find opposing views such as inclusion and exclusion, integration and board fence building. Traveling exhibitions, which change uh, depending on which European city they arrive at, could help understand such opposing views better and, and bring them closer. Uh, such traveling exhibition can include works from local artists that some local points of view may collide with, uh, with global perspectives. Workshop, uh, wor workshops and discussions accompan accompanying uh, the exhibitions also become important on such occasions. The traveling exhibition entitled On Mobility in 2006 in Amsterdam, Berlin, Vilnius, and Budapest was an example for that. In recent years, several large exhibitions held at various national museums in Western Europe. Uh, uh, they have also undertook the duty to explain its visitors that migration is a well-known historical phenomenon that strategies over the, the several uh, countries. One example is the Tate Britain's exhibition entitled Migration Journeys in the Inter-British Art in uh, 2012, which showed the history of migration in Great, Bit in, in Great Britain over the past 500 years. Penelope Curtis, then the director of the Tate Britain, wrote in the preface of the exhibition's catalog that cit citation, it is hard to define what qualifies as British, since many artists arrived from overseas to Great Britain over the past 500 years. From the 16th and 17th century, Flemish and Dutch landscape and still life painters who came to Britain in, in search of new patrons, the exhibition reveals how British art has been fundamentally shaped by successive waves of migration from Hans Holbein, Van Dyck, and Oskar Kokoschka. According to Curtis, the collection of Tate Britain is called British only out of convention. Another project from London is the Migration Museum Project. This is an institution covering all aspects of migration in the United Kingdom, including education and art. It arranges educational exhibitions and workshops for children so that the issues of migration would become for them a normal and everyday part of li life by the time of grew up. In contrast, the situation is a little bit uh, different in Eastern Europe. There we can see um, um, that we can see a categorical rejection of migration and efforts to halt it. Keeping silent about reality, keeping silent about migrants' personal history, the real life drama and tragedies, and stoking fear of migrants are a means to enforce political interests. That is why Eastern European artists often re reflect at the exhibitions at the media's shortcomings, that the media shows migration in a simplistic way and or 
in a very incomplete fashion. It is the artists there who undertake to break the silence. There are numerous examples for that among documentaries. One example is the documentary of Romanian director Matei Bejenarau in 2007 entitled Marsk Dubai. From 1990 onwards, there have been several migrant cases which are impossible to unearth by now. Lots of people have heard about them, but they did not make uh, the news since they were illegal and politics have ignored them. Photography and the documentaries are work working against that. Due to its political de de decisions, decisions, my country, Hungary, has made the headlines frequently. By Hungary's political leadership rejects mi migration and immigration, fomenting fear and hatred, masses of people have left the country over the past decades to emigrate to Western Europe in the hope of a better li life and a better job opportunities. While rejection immigration, the state of the cities, nation, or trade, uh, while rejection mi uh, migration, the state, often cites national traditions and national, national culture and it's ready to support exhibitions related to such matters. In addition to the state-run and state-sponsored art exhibitions, there are independent of the mainstream works of art that express the opinion of many artists and intellectuals driven by the view to do document the plight of these immigrants and explore the facts of current events. An Austrian cultur cultural institute in Budapest, the Austrian Cultural Forum, has organized several art exhibitions in recent years in the issue of migration, immigration, emigration. Among those, I would like to mention the exhibition uh, titled uh, uh, 45, 55, 95. Yeah. The title refers to three dates, to three historical events in Austria with an impact on hung hung Hungary history. Uh, when lots of people left Hungary and emigrated to the West for historical or economic reasons. I'm drawing attention to this exhibition in particular because it attempts to interpret emigration, migration, not only from today's perspective, but also as a phenomena, phenomenon of the past 50 years, even if not the past 500 years, like the London exhibition, and tries to interpret it as a historical phenomenon. I'm showing here uh, the works of Anet Hamori from this exhibition. The Hungarian-Austrian border was of key importance for migration in the past as well as even today. This was the so-called Iron Curtain in the communist era when a barbed fire fence separated the two countries at the border. The cutting through of the Iron Curtain in 1989 was an actual historical event that has all carried symbolic significance, the opening, the opening up of the East to the West, the fall of Kiyomunir, which lead to the unification of Germany. And other pictures uh, of hers, uh, yeah. other pictures of uh, Annette Hamery, uh, refers to, re uh, to recent event, uh, immigrants, refugees coming from Syria and Afghanistan are crossing Hungary's southern border. Another excellent example for migration uh, uh, and art in Hungary is the portrait series of Tibor Kocsisiszki. He requested, a person, uh, he requested permission from the Hungarian Interior Ministry to take pictures from migrant children in a refugee camp. He did that in a frontal style, like a police record photos. He painted his large size oil paintings based on those. The children with their personal life stories, 
make social development issues more realistic. They bring those closer uh, to the viewer. We can understand the artistic and political significance of these portraits if we consider that they were executed in a country that has built a razor wire fence on his southern border to stop the migrants. At the same time, bre Brexit is a different story as a dividing Europe. The question is not, not only whether the UK should remain or leave the European Union, but it's also about Europe's unity as such which is at stake. It further complicates the issue for Hungarians that hung Hungarians in large number have left Hungary over the past decade for the UK to live there. That's, uh, that's we arming at, uh, is it the United Continent or its political independence, independence that pursues national interest? Which one preferred? There are several levels and methods uh, to use in contemporary fine arts, new media to express these dilem dilemmas. We regularly see exhibitions in Europe dealing with these issues. Some examples I've seen lately in Florence, in Barcelona Museum, uh, National G uh, G Gallery, and Budapest uh, uh, History Museum. Here is another uh, uh, example uh, uh, from Szilard Cseke's installation representing the new life of Hungarian emigrant workers in London. And here you can see objects uh, that they uh, left uh, behind them. Uh, United Nations report uh, from uh, 2002, 16 years ago, Said that, uh, said that 165 million people do not live where they were born. I think that a few years from now, not migration, migration and art, and their relationship with politics will serve as the basic for discussion like this, but a rethinking of cultural identity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nomusa. And thank you very much, CAA and the Getty International Program for this invitation, especially Janet Lande. Thank you very much. Um, am I audible? Yeah. As 21st century members of a global community accustomed to instant worldwide networks, it takes a degree of historical imagination to comprehend the nature of interaction systems that had linked pre-modern societies. My co-panelists have already established the importance of moving away from insular understandings of nation-state identities by focusing on border crossings in varied contexts. My presentation takes a temporal leap backwards by several centuries to investigate the connected deep histories of South and Southeast Asia across Indian Ocean networks. By examining movements of ancient South and Southeast Asian artistic forms, ideas, and agencies, I hope to foreground the importance of cross-cultural histories of art and localization processes as indices of and as active agents in shaping distinct yet interrelated identities in early southern Asia. The motivations for long distance human and material migrations across the Indian Ocean zone during the first millennium were many, pilgrimage, trade, war, diplomacy, and more. Narratives of such travels and translocations and of 
their subsequent localization in the different zones of contact offer rewarding opportunities for investigating cross-cultural histories of art. Through case studies, I will explore now the role played by itinerant concepts and portable objects in the formulation of art vocabularies in distant lands. The sacred architectures of pre-modern South and Southeast Asia share much in common. Given that built forms are fixed in space and time, how are we to account for visually similar architectural expressions across vast distances? Was architectural transmission limited to the trans-regional travel of architectural concepts in the form of treatises? Did it involve the movement of artists? Were there other ways by which architectural knowledge spanned long distances? A closer engagement with sources that help answer such questions reveals two dominant modes of transmission. The transference of underlying concepts and mythologies which assume parallel yet distinct architectural forms in trans-regional contexts. And the mediation of the portable object which translates into architectural forms that reveal a closer visual correspondence than what is possible in the first case. Let us take the concept of the Meru or the cosmic mountain in Indian thought and its articulation in Khmer architecture. The motif of the mythical mountain Meru as the mountain of the gods, as a cosmic organizing principle located at the center of the universe with its summit being the highest point on earth is a well-established one, not only in Indian cosmography, but also as a symbol of Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain cosmology. Ancient Indian literature abounds in descriptive references to the Meru as the world axis, as the central mountain with four buttress mountains, as the navel of the universe encircled by concentric rings of land and seas, as the mountain upon whose summit is the city of the gods, and as the orienting principle of the directions. These interpretations of the Meru have traveled as ideas along trade routes and have translated in the Hindu Buddhist architecture of ancient Cambodia. The iconography of Meru in Cambodia signifies at once many levels of meaning, metaphysical, religious, and political. The realm of gods in heaven finds a parallel in the realm of kings on earth. It is in Cambodia that we find the most magnificent examples of temple mountains in the image of Meru, conceived on stepped terraces with the abode of God on its summit and with moats, causeways, barres, and dikes around the pyramid mountain in the image of the continents and seas encircling the Meru. The system of barres and dikes also served the important function of collecting and channelizing water. As state temples of successive Cambodian kings, the temple mountains also served as ritual centers of the successive capital cities. Indian Meru symbolism is localized in Cambodia on the substratum of its autochthonous belief in the supernatural powers of the mountain in accordance with its newly felt needs for rituals of kingship and concerns of water management. Here, it is a cultural idea, that of the Meru, that has traveled and generated newer visualities in a manner that is parallel but distinct from what is encountered in India. The idea journeys ahead to generate newer imageries. 
but the trans-regional movement of artistic knowledge and forms across Southern Asia is not limited to the transmission of concepts alone. There is substantial evidence for more tangible transfers of artistic know-how. While, while monuments were fixed in time and space, their representation on portable artifacts crossed many a boundary. Architectural imageries incised, carved, or painted on portable objects, votive offerings, terracotta ceilings, illustrated manuscripts, miniature models of stupas and temples, and stele engravings were carried by pilgrims, traders, priests, and monks on long distance journeys. Political embassies included gifts, often images of deities, which were sent as goodwill gestures from the court of one king to another. Pilgrimage to sites rendered sacred by myth or history has been a prevalent Indic practice since ancient times. Asian Buddhist pilgrimage follows the footsteps of the enlightened one, the Buddha, through visits to places that mark important events in Buddha's biography. His birth in Lumbini, enlightenment at Bodh Gaya, the first sermon at Sarnath, and the Parinirvana at Kushinagar being the big four. Bodh Gaya emerged as a significant ancient Buddhist pilgrimage center at least since the third century BC and has remained so to the present. At the dawn of the fifth century, the Chinese pilgrim Fa Yan had recorded the presence of a sim simple Bodhi temple at Bodh Gaya made sacred by its association with Buddha's enlightenment. In the, in the late sixth century, a Sri Lankan monk by the name Mahanaman donated towards a dwelling for the Buddha at Bodh Gaya. And in the seventh century, the Chinese pilgrim monk Yun Sang traveled to Bodh Gaya and gave a detailed account of the Mahabodhi temple and its environs. The Mahabodhi at Bodh Gaya has since seen several renovations in, the long, in its long history, the most noteworthy being the Burmese interventions of the late 11th and the late 13th centuries. Bodh Gaya's rising fame in pre-modern Asian Buddhist pilgrim circuits encouraged the production of miniature models of the Mahabodhi temple. About 15 to 20 centimeters tall, these temple models were portable and could be carried across long distances. John Guy has recorded at least 20 such miniature Mahabodhi replicas from the 10th, 11th to the 15th centuries that serve to this day, uh, that survive to this day and belong to various parts of the Asian Buddhist world, a majority from Eastern India, but also from Nepal, Tibet, and Myanmar. Most of these tiny temple models are carved in dark gray schist, typical of sculpture from Bihar in Eastern India, most likely prepared in a stone carver's workshop near Bodh Gaya. These miniature Mahabodhi rep replicas appear to have served multiple functions and carried multiple meanings, as pilgrim mementos upon return from Bodh Gaya, as meditational aids or three-dimensional mandalas, as a token or gift for those who aspired but could not undertake arduous pilgrimages to distant lands. The Mahabodhi replicas also served important architectural roles, inspiring, as John Guy has shown, the making of at least seven full-sized actual temples in various parts of Asia, built in the near likeness of the Mahabodhi prototype at Bodh Gaya. These pan-Asian constructions of Mahabodhi temples include the Mahabodhi at Bagan in Myanmar, which is the closest in form to the Bodh Gaya Mahabodhi. Another copy of the Mahabodhi the Shwe Gugi Pagoda was built under the patronage of the monk, Mon King Dhammacheti in Lower Burma. 
two Mahabodhi replicas, Wat Chet Yot at Chiang Mai, another at Chiang Rai in northern Thailand, 16th century Mahabodhi located in Patan in Nepal, built after, uh, after a Buddhist priest, Abhayaraj, who returned to Nepal after several years in Bodhgaya, and also two Mahabodhi-inspired temples from Beijing in China. Beyond peaceful migrations, conflict and war also promoted the dispersal of architectural vocabulary. Often, the most sacrosanct icon consecrated in the temple of an enemy king was looted and carried away as war booty. Pre-modern Indian and Southeast Asian epigraphy and Chinese dynastic annals tell us of the translocation of religious icons and precious artifacts as war trophies claimed by victorious kings from enemy territories. Such is also the case of the religiously potent and politically significant icon of Bhagavati Kautareshwari from South Central Vietnam, which was stolen, restored, destroyed, re-established several times in repeated intra-Southeast Asian encounters between the Cham kings of Southern Vietnam and their enemies from neighboring regions across the seas. Other portable artifacts, such as terracotta ceilings and bronzes, were also long-distance carriers of iconographies. Among these is the Pan-Asian iconography of Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara as the saviors of mariners from shipwreck. Avalokiteshvara as the ultimate embodiment of compassion became increasingly popular in Southeast Asia. Though based on Indian prototypes, local beliefs in each of the Southeast Asian regions had an important role in transforming iconographies. As the Lord and the protector of the people, his status at times rose to that of a state cult from whom the king derived legitimacy. An important dimension to Avalokiteshvara's popularity relates to travel for trade. His early icons offer significant evidence in this context, particularly those iconographic choices which visualize him as a savior from the eight great perils or the Ashta Mahabhaya Avalokiteshvara. Some of the earliest representations belonging to the fifth, sixth centuries are encountered at Ajanta Karla and Aurangabad in southwestern India. Pia Brancaccio and Osmund Boparacci have uh, unraveled the significance of these itinerant iconographies, drawing us to look closer at the iconographic choices made. In the interior of Cave 7 at Aurangabad, the eight great perils are shown all around an imposing sculpture of Avalokiteshvara, and prominent among these is the image of Avalokiteshvara as the savior of sailors from shipwreck. Maritime archeological research has in fact shown the presence of a strong Avalokiteshvara cult in Sri Lanka near the seaports and inland along navigable rivers. Such images of Avalokiteshvara offer yet another example of iconographies of pre-modern intra-Asian travel. Narratives of travel that reveal themselves in such transcultural iconographies and architectures often are embedded in the visuality of the artifact itself. This rich visual archives of intra-Asian travel is of course supported by other records such as epigraphs, travelogues, and annals. The visuality of art and architecture yet remains the most eloquent carrier of memories of an interconnected past, the complex processes of localization, and the shifting nature of cultural identities in the zone of contact. Thank you.
I'd like to invite Professor Saloni Matur as a discussant. Thank you very much uh, to our four speakers and uh, Namusa, our, our organizer. It's a pleasure for me to have been invited, can you hear me okay, uh, to serve uh, as a discussant for these four very stimulating uh, papers. We're a little bit short on time, but it seems uh, um, it would be a tragedy to leave these papers uncommented upon. So I think we have, if we can run over five, ten minutes. Um, uh, we're going to, anyways, join me. I don't think we're going to get kicked out of the room. So it's fr at, the f at the outset, it seems to me uh, to important to remind you all that the participants on this panel titled Border Crossings, the Migration of Art, People, and Ideas, have themselves journeyed from afar and crossed many borders to convene this, quote, global conversation today. They are supported by the CAA Getty International Program, which is now in its seventh year, and which has, has had as its goal to build international participation in the CAAs in order to diversify and enrich the membership in our scholarly community. Today's uh, panelists and chairs are art historians who teach, work, and write in South Africa, Brazil, Nigeria, Hungary, and India. Together, they represent four continents, Europe, Asia, Africa, and South America, and a wide range of art historical interests across a very broad time span. In other words, this is no armchair exercise about an abstracted topic, migration, but a kind of intellectual practice grounded in a dialectic between a shared approach to history on the one hand and a situated understanding of the present on the other. A number of questions seem to me to arise at the outset, therefore, related to the broader uh, and overarching theme of migration and border crossing. What kind of analytic or optic does this provide? Is it a methodology? in the disciplinary sense, an art historical methodology? Or is it more of a perspective or a thematic focus, one that clearly rejects stasis uh, in favor of fluidity, mobility, and the interconnectedness of the world? In this session, we have seen the rubric of migration illuminate seemingly incommensurable topics the migration of an individual artist in the 20th century, Cesar's uh, paper, the border crossings made possible by the new communication technologies and their role in enhancing the art discourses in Nigeria, the transmission of objects and aesthetic ideas within South and Southeast Asia in the pre-modern world, and of course the crises caused by anti-migration forces in the present, in particularly, and particularly the role that the visual arts can have in responding to these crises. So this leads to an opening meta question for me. Is that too many things? Is there anything we could conceive of outside of this lens and optic? Does it make sense, in other words, to think of the migration of people, art, objects and ideas together as a coherent inquiry? Is it, in other words, something that's stretched too thinly and thus compromised uh, as a um, intellectual rubric? Uh, so let me f consider that a little bit further then by looking quickly at the papers themselves. Uh, Cesar's paper, the first one, turned to the figure of the individual artists and to the relation between mar migration, therefore, and artistic subjectivity. In the example of the photographer Haruo Uhara, who was born in Japan in 1909 and migrated to Brazil in 1927, where he uh, would live and work until the very end of the century. He died in 1999. Significantly, as 
Cesar points out, this, is not, this was not a solo or lone experience of transplantation, but part of the Brazilian uh, state's policy to, quote, import Japanese workers to replace the workforce that uh, served on farms and plantations after the abolition of slavery in Brazil in 1888. Locating O'Hara's journey within the migration policies of the Brazilian state and its shift to a, quote, melting pot ideology in the early 20th century, Cesar points to this complex dialectic between photographs of nature, uh, the farm life and the Brazilian countryside, and the more, quote, your, to use your word, pragmatic scenes of family life that dominate his second phase of work during the 1960s, often read as a kind of uh, a record of his adaptation and assimilation to Brazilian life. Cesar suggests that this, quote, assimilation is actually entangled in the complexities of Brazil's unique racial fabric. Uh, but I was also struck by the strong uh, outsider quality of O'Hara's uh, rural, that is non-metropolitan photographic practice. He lived in the country on a farm his entire life, is my understanding. Which led me to the question, uh, how does the rural-urban tension um, further complicate the story of O'Hara's sort of modernist migratory aesthetic? If we think about, let's say, Raymond Williams' um, understandings of the country and the city, even for William still, um, uh, migration uh, and, in, and its contributions to an avant-garde had a metropolitan base. So how, does, how do we understand uh, uh, O'Hara then as belonging to, uh, uh, non-belonging to the cosmopolitanism uh, of modernism in the metropole? Uh, Peju offers a case study from Nigeria, namely the platform of the CCA Lagos, the influential art center founded by curator B.C. Silva in 2007, intended to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, intended to raise the critical engagement with contemporary art in Africa, especially new media and experimental forms. The way that the CCA has employed communication technologies, namely internet, social media, and web-based platforms, has been especially transformative, she argued, uh, in a developing or post-colonial society uh, such as Nigeria because of its nurturing, nurturing of connection, uh, raising visibility, discussion, and debate. At this point, I think we could all recognize in Peju's account the validity and centrality of what we might call, for lack of a better term, globalization's electronic frontier. By this, I mean, of course, the radical new potential of technologies for the migration of knowledge and for connecting human beings across time and space, and by extension, for galvanizing the discourses of art. But by definition, this terrain is a moving target and an entirely unprecedented and experimental horizon whose uses and abuses are also, of course, well known. I'm thinking, of course, uh, Facebook and its role in uh, election control and uh, the ever-present commercialization of these platforms. In relation to art, the internet and social media can foster engagement in all the ways that Peju has shown. On the downside, it can also produce a thinness of quality, a lack of depth of writing, and a perpetually sort of distracted forms of reception uh, by the kind of instant-like functions of Facebook and Twitter. We all quickly like and move on, as you know. So a question that ar then arises me, raised by Page's own critical assessment of the Lagos situation, is that how should we continue to think, to paraphrase your subtitle, about, quote, fostering linkages uh, in the information age? Um, I just got a gesture that said time is up, but can we take five more minutes just to finish the summation? Uh, well, I'm going to exercise my discussant right, and I'm going to take three more minutes, okay, just to be able to speak to the remaining two papers. Um, if we get kicked out, we'll, we'll you know, go out violently, I suppose. Um, uh, 
Turning to Parul, Parul used the theme of migration to, as she said, activate our historical imagination and to take, as she stated, a temporal leap backwards to examine linkages and networks across the Indian Ocean in the pre-modern period of South Asian art history, highlighting two particular modes of transmission that she called itinerant concepts and voyaging objects. Parul showed how architecture and monuments, namely built forms uh, that seem to be most recalcitrant from a migration perspective. They don't move, they're fixed in time and space. She and nevertheless read in their iconography uh, way, uh, kind of stories of migration through these objects. The built environment was also represented on terracotta objects and miniatures and traveled all around the world, uh, being offered up as gifts and souvenirs. And in the case of the Mahabodhi Temple, for example, these appeared to inspire similar buildings uh, in other parts of pre-modern Asia, namely in China, Burma, Thailand, Nepal, and Tibet, this extraordinary proliferation in the pre-modern era. What Parul argues is therefore a, quote, rich visual archive of intra-Asian travel um, raised a question for me, which is that how do we then in such a, a pl application of the methodology to the pre-modern period, how do we also continue to avoid the original copy dilemma and the hierarchies, of course, that the idea of a replica and then the reproduction um, generate? It reminded me, uh, that kind of problem of roots reminded me of uh, Cesar's sort of objections to interpretations of, by the Brazilian critics, O'Hara's um, photographs w that search for the kind of Japanese origins, right, of, of his aesthetic. In other words, the hunting for the primacy, the uh, originary moment. Origins, in other words, are attached to journeys. And we must continue to find ways, the internet seems to me to be one of them, to think um, beyond all those already fixing uh, terms. Finally, uh, shifting finally to Ildiko's uh, report, it comes from the front lines, if you like, of a fraught battle over migration today, namely from landlocked Hungary, located on the journey, on the, the journey from Syria and the Middle East to Western Europe, and whose right-wing government uh, has famously assumed a hostile anti-migrant policy that is, of course, under close scrutiny by Human Rights Watch. Citing T.J. Demos's work that focuses on the intersections between art, activism, and contemporary politics, Ildiko points to the responsibility that we, as professors, art historians, and students of culture, have to research, document, and engage with the very damaging effects upon human lives for those unlike ourselves in this room who are denied the entrance and mobility that migration entails. Here, it seems to me, the rubric of migration and mobility must be conceived necessarily through a dialectics of the crisis caused by immobility and detention. Ildiko's concerns drawn from the situation in Europe should not be lost upon those of us who work in North America today, where border walls, mass deportations, and so-called Muslim bans have become in the past year also official government policy and where xenophobic fear and anti-immigrant hatred has found expression in entirely unprecedented ways in this country. Ildiko's question is worth therefore repeating and putting to all of us yet again. What is and can be the role of art in such a situation? And how can and should art history respond to the hostile real wave of anti-migrant sentiment that we see today the world over. In other words, finally, as borders themselves become strengthened and fortified, it becomes all the more clear how important a migration perspective is for humanistic understanding. For borders and boundaries are things that are continually remade and unmade and are therefore mutable and subject to change. Artists, curators, teachers, uh, through imaginative acts, can, can help counter the terrible hold that far-right thinking 
has gained on the collective psyche. And we can interrogate how certain views become normalized and acceptable and refuse the acts of violence and militarism that border politics unleash. To the extent that all of the papers today have highlighted border crossing interventions that support alternate ways of seeing, they can be viewed as already having journeyed across an important threshold of some sort. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. <laughs>